Part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal has been leaked, and it contains some pretty scary intellectual property rules that will affect the video game industry. Let's chat about the impact down below, but first, my opinion. I'm Tarmac, and this is Feature Creep. I write agreements for a living, at least that's my official day job, working at a large organization in Canada. I don't get involved in any of the really heavy, world-changing ones, but when it comes down to the care and attention needed to develop a mass document like the TPP, I've at least got a finger or two in the pie. I am, however, not a lawyer and want to make that crystal clear before I proceed, though lay people can read these things and make sense of them, it just takes a little bit of patience. For those who don't know, there was a very significant negotiation going on among countries along the Pacific Rim. It's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and it includes the US, Canada, Australia, Japan, and a bunch of other countries. And effectively, the outward intent of this not-so-secret secret trade deal was supposed to be increasing trade across the multiple countries, making the passage of goods easier, which should benefit everyone. Or at least, that's what the groups supporting it claim. I can already hear the Europeans in the crowd wondering why they should care. Suffice to say that the agreement contains some very particular intellectual property clauses and the vast majority of video games are made by companies in the Pacific Rim. That's why you should care. So, these countries all got together and negotiated this massive trade deal, one that would make NAFTA look like a coloring book. And they had some help. There are 151 companies in the TPP coalition, of which companies that interact in the video game space are Disney, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Time Warner, and the MPAA. The intellectual property chapter, which WikiLeaks released a few days ago, is 61 pages long. Those companies involved, who lobbied for different aspects of the trade agreement, are for the most part, if not all, public companies with shareholders to keep happy. So, much like happens in the game industry with EA, Ubisoft, and Activision, the customer takes a backseat to the shareholder, as we've discussed in the past. It still has a final legal scrub to go through, but the negotiations are complete, and any final scrub isn't going to materially change the terms. I'll give you the referential section numbers as I go, so any fact checkers that watch this can look it up for themselves if they think I'm making anything up. So, let's dig into it. It's a really dry read, as you would expect whenever lawyers get involved. Per my own analysis and a few other online sources, one of the initial problems comes in the general tone of the chapter on intellectual property. I need to give the Electronic Frontier Foundation credit for this one as it's innocuous enough as to be missed unless you're looking for it. The idea that terms benefiting the rights holders are binding terms, whereas terms for consumers are not. The way to think of this is that countries must abide by the rights holder rules, and they should abide by the consumer protection clauses. This doesn't give much hope for the end user throughout the document. One example is that of fair use. In the United States, the concept of fair use essentially means that certain aspects of copyright law have exemptions, making parodies, news content, reviews, educational content, and so on, are protected. As an aside, the only real amusing part of the document is that most of the articles relevant to video games begin with QQ. The TPP does talk about copyright balance, but as I mentioned, it's not binding. Article QQG17 states that countries shall endeavor to achieve an appropriate balance in its copyright and related rights system. It's referring to exceptions to normal copyright law and provides some examples, but does not in any way mandate all countries to establish such a rule system. It's one of those unfortunate shoulds. Now, outside of the general tone, the first big issue that comes up is the copyright term extension, specifically section QQG6. Under the TPP, this is mandated, for simplicity, at creation plus 70 years with corporate works. This is designed to have the Pacific Rim countries match the US and EU copyright terms, which were already expanded what was initially set up when Disney started complaining about Mickey Mouse entering the public domain. Remember, though, that copyright term limits were intended to ensure that the creator of a particular work, and maybe the generation of his or her family afterwards, can benefit from that work. It was not intended so that a company could lock the material down ad infinitum. In the US, copyright terms used to be 28 years, then 56 years, then life of the author plus 50 years, and after Disney lobbied to close it down a few decades ago, life of the author plus 70 years. As I mentioned, this is already the current state of affairs in the US, but for example, Canada will have to extend copyright terms by 20 years to match. 
The link to video games here won't be felt for a while, at least not overtly. The first real video game published was Pong back in 1972 by Atari Inc., which of course has a long ways to go before entering the public domain under current rules, let alone adding 20 years or more depending on the country. Other works, however, are affected. Disney is a good example of that. Without the rules being changed, it wouldn't have been long before you could have made a video game based on Mickey Mouse without needing a license to do it. I admit that this is a bit of a stretch, but it's worth being aware of. Next up is Article QQH8 on trade secrets, which mandates the parties to implement criminal procedures and penalties for the unauthorized willful access to trade secrets held in a computer system. On its face, this is clearly designed as a corporate protection against Edward Snowden types. However, it has a bit of a side implication as well. Game journalists, or regular people for that matter, could in fact be charged criminally for exposing unreleased game information. It doesn't specify first-party access to a trade secret, meaning the person that actually snagged the info from the company's computers. Obviously, this would require a company capable of committing public relations suicide, but, well, Nintendo is still claiming YouTube revenue, Sega still hasn't dealt with the Shining Force copyright takedowns, and Ubisoft seems to have no problem advertising Might & Magic Collector's Edition saying it comes with a disc, but shipping with no disc. PR is nebulous, and honestly, if damaging information came out, I could see this one being used in a very negative fashion. Now, we know that the current use of the DMCA for copyright takedowns is being abused. TPP Section I, which is shortly after QQH11 if you're hunting through the text, refers to legal incentives for internet service providers who cooperate with copyright owners to take down or block access to infringing content. Again, this is obviously intended to push against piracy, but given the rather rampant abuses occurring in takedown policies, those legal incentives put very legitimate activities into dangerous territory. It means governments can pay ISPs to take down content. And what major intellectual property agreement wouldn't be complete without talking about DRM circumvention? QQG10 mandates a full ban on getting around DRM and does not differentiate DRM circumvention from actual infringement, meaning you're guilty even if you don't share it. From the perspective of a gamer, obviously piracy is a thing, but it's by no means the only thing that involves DRM circumvention. Modded consoles, of course, for one. Any video game history archive will in effect be banned unless countries specifically permit historical archiving, which of course isn't mandated. The hosting, creation, or use of DRM circumvention of any kind, that would include ROMs, which means that the tool-assisted speedrun community is essentially screwed. Or what about people who hunt through game hardware and software, letting the public know when a company is collecting too much information, or has DLC game data on the disc? Be very aware though that this is not just people who make and host DRM circumvention tools. It specifically states that it includes people who knowingly, or have reasonable grounds to know, circumvents without authority any effective technological measure that controls access to a protected work. That is talking about the average consumer who in their own home circumvents DRM using somebody else's tools. You are implicated and treated as though you infringed on the copyrights whether you shared it or not. Remember also that basic disk copyright protection measures include far more than things like Steamworks or Securom. Proprietary file formats are also a form of DRM. They're intended to prevent people from getting into spots the devs don't really want them to be. And where does that leave us? Since video game modding often requires the modification of proprietary files and the circumvention of DRM, it means that game modders will be committing copyright infringement by modding video games. And I've saved the worst for last, so thanks for sticking around long enough to hear this part. This is section QQH4. Civil damages have no mention whatsoever of a cap, beginning of course with the retail cost, but mandating that judges have the authority to order pre-established damages at the election of the rights holder, as well as additional damages in the case of an infringement. Rights holders are likely to try to use those multi-million dollar music sharing lawsuits as precedent. In addition to the financial penalties, not only can the infringing material be destroyed upon seizure, but the device involved in the infringement can also be destroyed. So, you download a game illegally, fine, you're an asshole, but the police show up, seize your computer, which ends up being destroyed, as well as the court laying down a big fine. Does that sound excessive to you? It does to me. Reference point specifically is QQH417D. And even further beyond that, your punishment for infringement can be even bigger if it occurs on a commercial scale. Commercial scale is undefined, but it specifies that commercial scale doesn't mean done for financial gain. Commercial scale, not commercial revenue. 
If DRM circumvention is deemed to be copyright infringement, however, and as I mentioned, modding can often require getting past the DRM, large-scale mods used by plenty of people could put the modder in danger of being liable for infringement. Archive.org is a website with, you know, significant historical relevance for video games, they could be liable. The scariest part of this, however, is that commercial scale bit. What is commercial scale, especially since financial gain is irrelevant? Is 100,000 downloads considered commercial scale? I would think so. And this kind of infringement at a commercial scale involves criminal procedures, not just civil, which results in jail time. The criminal procedures piece is section QQH5. As a scary example, I'm going to bet that Durante had to break into some proprietary file formats to figure out how best to implement DS Fix for Dark Souls, and he's had hundreds of thousands and even probably millions of downloads at this point. Is that worth jail time? Is that worth jail time to him? It's going to dissuade an awful lot of modders from getting involved in all of this. The TPP is bad. It's very bad. I've spent a fair bit of time reading through the intellectual property chapter that WikiLeaks posted, and quite frankly, the specificity in some areas and vagueness in others is pretty scary. It's very obviously a document written entirely by the 151 TPP coalition companies to protect and further their interests with nobody in power in the room to speak to consumer protection. I'd like to take this time to point out a few resources that I think you should check out. In the description, I have links to the intellectual property chapter text, as well as some sites local to a few of the major countries taking part in this. Remember, the context of this agreement is that it has been negotiated in secret for a while now and was recently completed in its final draft form. Each individual country needs to officially ratify the agreement, which will be taking place over the next few months. It is debatable at this point whether public outcry can actually change whether that ratification happens, but if people don't even try, then the battle is lost before it even began. Take a look through a few of the links and educate yourself a bit more on the TPP if you can. Gamers potentially stand to lose quite a bit if this agreement is ratified. So I know that this is a heavy topic, but I wanted to ask for your comments, as I always do on Feature Creep, so that we can discuss it further. As I mentioned, I'm not a lawyer, so nothing I say here can be considered legal advice or such, but comprehending these agreements can be done by a layperson if you're willing to do a bit of reading. Feature Creep is a regular show every week, so please do subscribe to the channel and share this video around wherever you see fit. That's all I have to say. Tarmac out.